thank Alex for, uh, I was in Michigan State earlier in the year, and I gave a version of this talk, and uh, I think I, he probably liked it, and so he contacted me, and uh, also thanks to Jairo, who is not here, but uh, Jairo and I go back uh, a ways, we were in graduate school together, so I'm not offended, but he's already seen the talk, so. And thank you, very. this is an unusual setting for me because of two things, right? So here's a bunch of people who are roughly in the same area of, you know, of physics. I mean, you're not string theorists and plasma physicists. And also, you're roughly in the same uh, stage of your career. So I've actually, I, I'm trying to think of it. I've never actually spoken to a group like this. I mean, I've spoken to graduate students. I've spoken, spoken at colloquiums, but it's all much more. So it's a... Uh, it's a different uh, feel for me, so just stop me at any time with any kind of questions you have. And the other thing is my talk by design, you know, it doesn't have to go from start to finish or anything like that. It's kind of modular by design. There are parts of it I could just skip. And at any time, feel free to stop me and ask me questions. I know the camera's on, so I will try to be as frank and open as possible uh, with that, uh, you know, kind of the back of my mind. So, uh, <laughs> so let's see. So just a few, uh, so this is, of course, you always have to start with something uh, humorous, and there it is. And I, I don't actually know if Rudolf Perls actually said that, but uh, you know that uh, there is basically too much information, the journals keep growing, and, of course, there is debate as to whether the pages of our journal or any journal actually convey that much that is indeed meaningful. We don't know. We'll see. Just to give you some idea what the journals are, I mean, it's, it is interesting that the physical review journals, and this is mostly PRL specific, is essentially has over the years, and it, certainly over the last decade or couple of decades, it's mostly, it's, by numbers, it's a European journal. Right. I mean, the American component of it has stayed essentially flat, so fractionally dropping uh, over the years. As uh, Europe has been growing, uh, as a fraction of submitted and published papers, China has been growing considerably over the last few years also. And so this is just to give you some idea of the numbers. At any time, please do stop me. I mean, I, we haven't come to any interesting parts yet. but. Uh, Feel free to stop me and ask me any questions or anything you want me to ask. So just give you some idea of the scale. I mean, I don't know if this is good or bad, right? I mean, uh, it, it could be that we just publish too many papers. I mean, that's, uh, there's too much stuff. But anyway, just give you a, uh, some sense of the scale of the journals and what we publish. And the other thing I want to point out is that we, you know, people say, and we, it's true that we, our journals are truly global in the sense that two-thirds, or over two-thirds, when I say two-thirds, I mean 70 percent, pretty much, of the uh, papers come from outside the U.S., the referees are from outside the U.S., and the money, which is not something um, I particularly am worried about, but the, for the APS, I mean, the money also, the source of revenue, that is, the subscriptions are mostly from outside the U.S. Of these, the one thing that changed during the years uh, that I've been there is a fraction of referees. So uh, about 10, 12 years ago, the papers were already about two-thirds from outside the U.S., but the referee pool was still overwhelmingly uh, America-centric. And that has changed by... Uh, uh, yes, please. So a quick question. The, the impact factor, do you have data for the impact factor, say, for the last five years? I have the data for the impact factor. I have it as a sidebar. I'll, I'll go into it if you want, right? I mean, that's an interesting, and if you have questions, I'll come into it. I have a little, like a modular piece on it, which I sometimes speak about or don't. But if you want to hear about it, I'll go into it. All right, so PRL has a particular, it's kind of a self-imposed balancing act that we try to do, and this kind of explains the difference. And we, you can have questions about this, and we talked about a bit of it with some people. Uh, that makes us, I think, different from pretty much any other physics journal because we have kind of imposed upon ourselves over the years, and whether we do it well or not is a separate issue. These, these four things we'd like to do. So just to go, so firstly, size. So there are journals which are small that publish a few hundred papers a year. Our intent is to be reasonably large. 
Now, what is large is a different question, but we do not, for example, think that PRL should be publishing a few hundred papers a year. Currently, and I'll come to that in a bit, are the numbers we publish are uh, about 2,500 a year. Uh, so we want to be sizable. We want to have breadth. By breadth, I mean that we do not want to not publish in any areas of physics which substantial numbers of physicists think is physics. So for example, we publish papers in plasma physics which are not as well cited as a group, as a, as a subsection of physics. And we also publish in astrophysics which is extremely well cited compared to condensed matter, for example. We publish everything from you know, nanostructure physics to networks. So that's the breadth. We want representation, by which I mean, if we publish in a field of physics, our hope is that we publish enough areas in that particular area of physics so that if somebody comes in from outside the field, you can tell them that if you look at the papers that appeared in PRL in the course of the year, you will have a good sense of the arc of development of the field in that course of the year, right? Which means that if we were to publish plasma physics, we just had, at the end of the year, if we had, like, say, let's say we were publishing 200 papers a year, it could be that plasma physics, there would be one or two papers a year. And then for the plasma physicist, it would just be a sporadic presence out of nowhere. We don't want that. And the last thing is, of course, we still want to be the exclusive club that people find very difficult to get into, right? And that's the, so it's a balancing act, and we are sitting out, and I'll, we can, you can ask me any kind of questions you want, and I, I'll go with the rationale, but to balance these four, we, we kind of in a uh, self-imposed size limitation, exclusive limitation, and all that. So anyway, but those are the four things, the way I see it is PRL's charge. This I just brought up here, I don't, didn't really, I thought I'd take this slide out, but then I realized that there are many people in this room who do not realize that PRL is still a print entity. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have seen it, but here it is. And this is a real effect. Unf I think it's a little unfortunate for PRL, and all the journals actually. If you think about it, in this day and age, all journals are electronic. But what you think of as a published entity is still uh, essentially paper, right? Because you're looking at a PDF file. I mean, you're sitting here looking at the archive, and what you're looking at is a PDF entity which is, looks like it does because it has to come out of a printer. I mean, people have, I mean, you have online, you know, even we have all our articles now are HTML uh, online entities, but the determining uh, rationale is still paper, which for PRL I think is a bit of an issue because we have the length restriction which is not just because of paper, but it's kind of, uh, you know, that's the rationale behind it, and, uh, you know, supplemental material muddies the water there, but that's what it is. But it's big. This is, a, this is before our recent uh, shrinking down, which I'll come to, but this is a month's output. Um, actually, why do you still have a printed version? We have a printed version because it's very cheap to produce. If people, I mean, the, the the, the, the uh, number of articles that we, uh, the number of uh, copies that are printed has been dropping. And what I've heard from our money people is that the cost now is so little that if there are, you know, 500 people who want print, and I think really it's not, you know, maybe a couple of thousand are printed. We will provide them with print. I mean, print on demand would be more complicated, let's put it that way. But do you actually sell these booklets? Uh, to very, very, very few people, yeah. I mean, there are large universities which get one copy and then they squirrel them away in some, uh, some archival repository somewhere and no one gets to see it. Yeah, so there is some demand for print. Uh, in fact, uh, I've, I've heard, I mean, this is a sidebar, we can you know, keep talking about things, but so I went to India, which is interesting, and I, I asked them, why do you still want print? And the librarian said, well, if we get, it's iTunes versus CDs, right? So if you give us online access, and let's say I run out of money, then my access is gone and I have nothing to show for it. Whereas if I get a print copy, and that's, he said his director told him that, if you get a print copy, even if you lose your access, you have everything that you already got sitting in a library somewhere. I mean, that's the argument, right? Why do I, why would I ever buy any music if I have Spotify? Because this is, I mean, the journals are Spotify, right? You, you don't pay, you don't get it. 
Uh, currently, it's 2,500. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll show you. Uh, so compared to, let's say, I think nature physics would be of the order of 250, right? So it's an order, order of magnitude. But uh, why, why the subscription model working the way it does then? No, because it'll be, it'll be it, it, well, uh, I mean, it's, it's cheap to print, but it's not cheap to distribute. So I think, for example, there are some places, I mean, the, the, really, the most libraries don't want print. No, I mean, I mean uh, the fact why, the, why, why in your example, in your city, won't print is because they cannot get a version. No, they have, they both, they have online. Everybody no, has. No, it there would be a variable that is important <coughs> to subscription. So why is well, that's a different question. I mean, but that's true. I mean, that's true of pretty much all subscription models, right? Yeah, I mean, right. Uh, so it is true that there could be some argument, which may be, I don't exactly know in our case, but my sense is that there are different pricings for, for example, archival articles versus uh, current articles. So that the, the online repository going back to you know, the early 20th century is probably differently priced and so on. I, I mean, I, I don't know the exact details behind the pricing scheme and all that. And also, for example, different universities, different countries pay not the same amount. And right. yeah, I mean, this. But still, I mean, uh, APS is non profit. Right? That's right. So we are cheaper, but we are. But, but right. also, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't cost anything to provide a kind of copy for, for previous years. Uh, for, for the time when the, for the period when an institution is subscribed. You mean provide the paper copy, you mean? No, uh, archival electronic copy. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm sure there is some, I, I mean, one could be skeptical about it, but there is some business reason as to why it's not just the current version that's free, uh, that has a price behind it, but also the archival versions. We can discuss yeah. about it later, but I'd be, I'd be speculating as to what the rationale might be. Um, so in answer to your question, this is kind of, so PRL, um, about three years ago we were publishing of the order of 4,000 articles a year. So that was about 80 a week, and we were kind of a weekly entity nominally. And there was a general sense that we felt that we could be publishing significantly fewer papers, partly because we would not lose, and we wanted to publish fewer papers but still be able to maintain the four, you know, the criteria that I mentioned. And we have currently settled on, and this is uh, something we are comfortable with, at about 2,500 papers a year. So that's a substantial drop, and that's more than a 25% drop. So that's last year. So we've gone down from 4,000 papers a year to 2,500. So that's 80 a week to 50 a week, roughly. I mean, we don't say 50 a week, but that's the, on, in the course of the year. And uh, there are, you know, some people think that if we were publishing maybe 2,000 papers a year, that would be okay too. But the general sense is that if, if we were publishing 1,000 papers a year, we would have to go to certain fields or, uh, and say that your presence in our journal would be very, very limited. And that's something we're reluctant to do. How, how does, for example, nature physics? I think nature physics, um, well, this is a, complicated thing to answer. So I, in a sense, I'm answering it for nature physics, right? Which I shouldn't, okay. But I think if you go down, so what would happen if we went down to let's say 500? So one of the examples to give you is FISREV X, right? There's this new entity. So what will happen is you, I mean, assuming you have a very, you have a decent editorial process. So you can weed out and you're, so one of the problems is if you're that small, it'll become very arbitrary by design. I mean, PRL, as, you, as it is, people are complaining is arbitrary. If you told me to cut it by an order of magnitude, uh, it will be quite arbitrary. But arbitrary may not be bad. I mean, one could argue that all kinds of things are cut in all kinds of weird ways, and that's arbitrary. But the real effects would be, first, I think, is that you would have to make a decision to, ha to have certain areas of physics with many, many practitioners in those areas have essentially zero presence in your journal which if you have nature physics, for example, 
I would be hard pressed to find a paper on plasma physics and nature physics, right? A, and B, there could be some areas, and that's from the journal's point of view, they might decide that, okay, we don't really want to publish too many papers in that area or something. And the other thing would be, because of the limited, and PRL, of course, you know, we are here where we are, right? We don't want to, so we have credibility in many, many areas. And if we were to go down, there would be certain areas which would basically walk away from us. So string theory, for example, right? I mean, there are journals which have great trouble attracting that community. We have them, right? So we don't want to get into a scenario where suddenly, you know, so that's the partly. I think what will happen, you become sporadic, presence in many fields will drop significantly, and if you're engineering things like impact factor, then you have to make those in with other. This is probably politically incorrect, but I still want to ask it. So is this minus 25% somehow correlated with your breakdown you showed us for the countries? So I'm asking that is it uniform cut or Europeans still publish a lot? Uh, I would uh, not, uh, I, well, when we're cutting, I mean, we are really not looking at the country at all, right? But in, in fact, what happens? In fact, what will happen is I can give you, I mean, again, I don't have, I have numbers for them, not here. Uh -huh. For example, I think the acceptance rate, right? Acceptance rate is the likelihood of getting published from Europe is actually marginally higher than the U.S. now. Now, that could be for any number of reasons, right? It could be because... Uh, you know, LHC papers are coming out of Europe or something like that. I don't know. And the other thing is I would say that papers from China, for example, their absolute number of submissions, but proportionately the quality of the papers that come from there have both gone up. So I my, in fact, I'm quite sure, unless the denominator has grown sharply, that the uh, acceptance rate from papers from China is higher now. So that's one, one way to think about it. But uh, it could be that, but on the other hand, China is going through a phase where there are many, many universities submitting papers to us, so the denominator is growing pretty quickly, too. Uh, not important, skip that. All right, so this is roughly in 2012. This has changed a little bit because we are, so you can see that PRL, if you think of uh, condensed matter as what you think as condensed matter, and soft matter, which everybody else thinks of as condensed matter, then uh, it's about 70%, it was about 70% of the journal. Uh, that number, I'm sure, has dropped, I mean, fractionally dropped, because uh, as we have shrunk, uh, the biggest absolute decline has been in condensed matter, is my sense. Because, again, one of the arguments for that is some of the fields, their presence was so small I think we are publishing fewer papers in plasma physics than, in top, than on topological insulators, maybe three years ago. And that's just, and maybe that's the numbers, but that's. All right, so that's a rhetorical question. Skip that. All right, so this is something we were discussing yesterday with some people. So of course, as a journal, especially if you want to be, you know, you want to tweak things like impact factor, there's tremendous temptation at certain times of, to publish more in certain areas, right? So this, for example, is the profile of graphene in PRL up until 2010, but I'll have similar numbers for later. So when you look at this, that's not a small number of graphene papers, right? So is this the... All right, forget that. So if you look at the blue uh, bar there, so that's uh, over 100, almost 125 graphene papers in the course of the year, right? That's not a small number. So if you think about it, that's half the size of nature physics. And the effective, you can calculate an, ef an effective impact factor for any set of papers, right? You just go to Web of Science and you do it. So the effective impact factor for that set was 15. Those are the graphene papers published in PRL. Right? So, so the temptation is, as an editor who is uh, in charge of graphene, is to publish more and more graphene, more and more topological insulators, more and, you know, and so the thing is, if you want to have a journal that's of a particular size, you, in a sense, you have to resist the temptation. And that's, that, get, that gets to be difficult, I think, and especially if you're a smaller journal. But anyway, so that's PRL. So we have, so unfortunately for those folks who are working on graphene, and who are submitting to PRL, it, it could very well be <laughs> that the effect, you know, if PRL were a graphene-only journal, the impact factor of PRL would be, you know, 
that number. But we are not, because you're sitting in a sea of papers which are from <coughs> lesser cited areas, if you will. It's a big journal, there's a big denominator, so there's that. And this argument applies to, you know, in five years ago, you could have talked about nictite superconductors. I think the effective impact factor for hundreds of papers published in PRL was of the order of 20. Because it, you know. All right, skip that. All right, so these are points that I kind of wa walked over. So basically, the way I see it as, as, a, as a journal editor, because PRL is, has all these different communities, so we have theoretical versus experimental. It's very different. To give you an example, in the kind of areas, mesoscopic transport, uh, quantum hall, that kind of area, the acceptance rate for theory papers is about one half of that of experimental papers. So that's one way to think about it. Uh, when I have a conversation about PRL with a high energy physicist versus a condensed matter physicist, the, the way they see the journal is completely different. So this is why I said this is a, you know, kind of a different uh, group of people. Basic versus applied, there are, I have discussions all the time with people who think that there is a clear line of separation between what's <coughs> basic and what's applied. And when you talk to string theorists, to them the concept of applied physics doesn't even exist, right? Whereas if you talk to somebody who is working on, uh, again, graphene as an example, uh, some of you know that, I mean, by definition, that field will have to move into applied areas. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, anyway, so, I mean, uh, this, the last one I have is the fact that a network, somebody who works on networks and somebody who's a plasma physicist, I mean, they're doing physics, and it appears in PRL, but they're pretty, you know, distinct and as far removed from each other in terms of interest as they could be. All right, this is something, I put it up here, various discussions about impact factor, and, but I can talk about it later. All right, we can come back, I can skip a section. I'll ask you before a particular mod module if you're interested, and you can ask me to skip to that or not, okay? Skip that, skip that. So this is currently, this is, I have a question mark because this is what we have settled at. So on average, we're publishing at this time about 2,500 papers a year, substantially fewer than we did three, four years ago. That is about 50 papers a week, roughly. So I have, I mean, my sense is it's okay, but I don't know, we'll find out. Is it, is it informed, uh, so if yes. you want to keep graphing papers, everyone, you want to <coughs> No, we don't. That's the point, right? So what we have to, the, the only way to do it is, the way we're trying to do it is basically every editor has been asked, charged, if you will, to kind of, as the paper is being reviewed, I mean, if they're not publishable, that's different, right? So, but if you're getting kind of a positive signal about the paper, we want the editor to look closely at the paper reviews and so on to see if the paper if a solid case has been made for the paper to be in PRL. And uh, because, you know, editors have their own interests and their own backgrounds, right? And so, and they often, their attitude is, I really like it, or I went somewhere and there was very good buzz about it, you know? But then, uh, that, that sentiment could be there from the plasma physicist who went to a plasma physics conference a cold atom person who has been here. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, the way I, I, I kind of think about it is, uh, I don't know if sure everybody does, is if somebody came to us, right, if the APS gurus came to us and said, you know, you guys have 50 slots a week, that's it. And, you know, then you'd have to make room. I mean, the joke I have is there's no one here from India, but, uh, you know, the buses in Calcutta, we used to have this <laughs> conversation, were very crowded. So the joke was, if a person gets on at the back, somebody has to fall off the front. <laughs> so, so it is almost like that. There you have, I mean, we operate almost as if we have a quota, but we don't really, right? I mean, journals do, some journals do have quotas. So can I ask a very specific question yeah. along the lines of what you just discussed? So the idea of the editors along the line of the reviewing process needing to decide you know, whether a paper that's clearly scientifically right. uh, valid, uh, seems <coughs> interesting, right. is appropriate or not. say having uh, two referees, initially one up, one down, not for scientific reasons, round of revisions, go back, both referees now up, 
But the editor brings in a new referee who gives a new criticism. Right. Again, it's not scientific, but it's about affirmativeness. Yeah. And so it kind of feels, <clears throat> in that situation, I kind of felt like it was, I didn't know what the rules of the game were. Right. Because there was a new referee brought in after we appeased. And the other mm -hmm. point of it, but of course, is that you're allowed two rounds of review, and then you go into this more complicated Right. So my, I mean, it's a different, I mean, I, I don't know when, whatever scenario, when it played out, but if it were to play out today, my, well, our general sense is that the up, down, so the way I kind of see it is when a paper comes in, I mean, there are some papers which the editor has considerable upfront knowledge about. They may have even talked to the, you know, solicited and all that kind of thing. You know, there are papers coming out of all kinds of places that we have a solid interest in getting. That's different. But for the average paper that comes in, it's like it's sitting in a ground state, which to us is not PRL. And we need to see some signal that excites it, right? And the signal is not that the referee says publish it. The signal has to be that the referee says publish it, and in a sense, the referee has to say publish it, and it should not be in FISRA B, for example, because of this, this, this. And so, in that, I don't know what happened in that case, but now we routinely, and some of you may have received it, if a referee says publish it, for to us seems like no real good reason. We may even go back to the referee and ask them, all right, so what is the rationale for publishing in PRL? And the pulling in the third, you know, the extra referee, and it could have been for, for reasons like this, but what I, what I would sympathize with you is if that was not made clear to you as to why it was done, or if the first round the referees were given a pass or you were led on, so to speak, uh, without uh, sufficient. So in other words, it's entirely possible and we fairly often turn away papers even though referees you know, have said publish. Uh, often we'll ask the referees to reassess, given uh, because we, don't, we have a sense that some referees do not assess it on the, you know, on the grounds that they should be. Or we will sometimes, the authors will receive positive reports, but we'll tell them that we are not persuaded because of whatever reason. So this is a bit of a change compared to even three years ago, I think. Well, I mean, uh, the way, I mean, this is a, it's a very subjective issue, right? I mean, so in other words, my defense here is of course, that if we, if we were publishing a magnitude you know, order of magnitude fewer papers, I would have no apology for being arbitrary because my attitude would be, yeah, hey, what the heck, I mean, I'm just gonna be arbitrary. But at this stage, we are, our hope is that we're making a fair assessment. So the way I see it is that if I get a paper, let's say I get a paper from you, my assessment, my, my general sense is the general interest thing doesn't mean that it has to be read by anybody outside this room even, or somebody who works with you. But my, po my thinking is, that the paper should have set out to do something, solve a problem or address some issue. And while the bulk of the paper should not be, I, I mean, need not be of any interest to other physicists, but why you are doing that problem and, or, and why that problem needs matters in the broad sense of the term should be something that you should be able to explain to a plasma physicist or a polymer physicist. Not the paper, but the intent of it. Now it could be that the there's a context they don't know, like, uh, you know, if somebody ha so to think about it, I mean, we receive a gazillion proposals of this or that ways to find the Myron or fermion in some kind of nanostructure, right? So to me, I have, I mean, I probably have some sense, but it's not, so if I put the paper in PRL, I mean, this is a made up scenario, but I would have to be able to go to a polymer physicist and say, hey, look here, all these Proposals are being made, but this one really matters because of this reason, and this is why, you know, that's the kind of thing. Not the paper, but the point, and that's kind of so a... Do you really feel it's important that polymer physicists... Sorry, what? Polymer care? No, I, I, are you seriously thinking that this is an important metric, that a polymer physicist would matter? I mean, the broader... That's right. So I don't expect the polymer physicist to read or understand the paper, but at least why that... Why there is something call a Myron a bound state, and that a whole bunch, hundreds of condensed matter physicists are running after it, and at the end of the day, why this particular paper, that, that's something that should be able to, you, I mean, that should, the, they should be able to convey, conveyable to them, I think, that's the point. 
I mean, one of the arguments, is just today we had a discussion. Um, it was, it's something in, uh, editors were discussing. We received a paper on some kind of uh, detection of some gravitational waves or something. And apparently it's a, I have no idea. I don't know, it's not my field, but apparently many proposals are being made about detecting it using non-traditional methods. Most of, this, most of the people in this room have no idea which of those proposals are important or not. When you see it in PRL, what you should assume is that it's correct. Correct in the sense that there's, it's self-contained correct, right? But why that one? Why not five others? And that is part of the journal's job, I think, to sift it in that manner. Anyway. No, we don't. Uh, okay, so this is a tough one. Right. So, the, so this is the thing. So, in other words. So overselling is kind of promoting. Oh well, but if you oversell routinely, that's no. So here, so when I send you a paper as a referee, right? So let's say I'm sending a paper on some kind of. Uh, I don't know, let's say I'm sending a paper on some graphene on boron nitride structure to Corey, right? My thing is, I don't want to hear from him, you should publish the paper because I like it. What I would like to hear from him is that if I could, I would send it to 10 of you, and then I would take a poll. <laughs> so you're speaking for, as a representative person of your community. That in, this, in the course of the year, if there are a whole bunch of these papers coming out, this would be one I would really want you to publish. Because of this, this is reason. Now, if Corey routinely says publish everything, then I know that uh, I have to calibrate it. Which so that, I know. all right? Which I know. Which you know. <laughs> but you know, but that's the point. I mean, so in other words, when I'm sending you a paper, I am interested in your expertise and your being able to tell whether it's valid and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, that subjective question that I'm asking you, which I will assess separately, is I would ask you to put on your hat as as if you're speaking for everybody in this room. That's a tough one, but that's what subjectivity. And just make one other comment, which I would consider, if my interest would be more in the other side, like what if I send you a paper in an area that not many people are working on because maybe there aren't that many good ideas and say I somehow come up with a great idea. So I, it just concerns me a little bit that you say that you know, the grand state of the paper is not PRL and you need referees to not only say get published, yeah. but to give some great rationale. Because if they don't have a vested interest, they're not working. They may say, wow, that's kind of cool. Yeah. But I mean, so this is a tough one, right? Because, so, so this is a free-flowing discussion, right? So we won't get through the talk, but that's okay. Uh, this is what I prefer. No, I, I like this. Uh, so the way is, uh, so as an editor, right, my first charge is, and we've, I've had discussions with people about this, and some people think we are being too careful, maybe. My first charge is not to publish something which is immediately recognized by most people in the community that it's blatantly incorrect, right? And that has happened. And that our, I think our record there is pretty good. There are other, you know, right? And this kind of pressure is less so in physics than biology, for example, there are all these kind of. So that's the first one. But the second fear is that I don't want to turn away a paper for whatever reasons, bad referees, bad advice, my personal, incorrect sense of its uh, importance, then it gets published in APL or some other place. And then uh, within a year, the general sense of the community was that's a you know, pretty good paper. And then I, you know, I think, uh, but the risk of the latter happening is very small. And so unfortunately for you as an author, most papers that come into PRL are not gonna, I'm, my, my, in other words, if I'm incorrect, the risk for the former are much greater than the latter. So that's one way to think about it. So in a sense that, right, I mean, I mean, there are papers that come in with all kinds of signals. I mean, I have papers where it could be that somebody I know uh, told me ahead of time that look out for this paper, or I talk to people, I have a good sense of it. That's a different kind of, but I'm talking about the paper where uh, I am as an editor passively sitting in my desk and you know, it comes through the system. Yes, sir. Do you possibly, do you trace this the track of the paper after it's published? Of course. And, and see if, uh, and so after this 25% cut, do you see that those papers you still accept generally are cited better? Well, one of the ways to, right. Compared to those before? Uh, no, I think what, so 
the way I, we, we have pretty good numbers on this, right? People are following it very closely. I don't do it, but there are people who are yeah. good at it. So for example, we know for a fact that the impact factor as an indicator of PRL is not gonna go up much, right? Because the 25% cut is mostly in papers that would have been in the denominator, but we have, I have a plot at the end which I can show you, I don't know if I, where even if we cut PRL with great perfection, in the, word, in, in the sense that if we, were man, if we managed to slice off, if you will, the thousand papers that would, with the benefit of hindsight, have been the least cited. The impact factor of PRL is not gonna budge more than a point. So that's not gonna get reflected in that. So the way to think it is, uh, what fraction of papers are you publishing that most people would not agree that it should be a PRL? So that's kind of what I would call the tail. Mm -hmm. uh, purely going by citations is difficult because, that, because we're rejecting a lot of papers on topological insulators, which are gonna be much more highly cited, and this is always a, we have discussions about this all the time, than the pretty decent papers in some other areas. I mean, there's a reason that FISREF D, uh, which is, you know, not, does not have a particularly more careful review process than FISREF E, has an impact factor that is three times as much, right? And that's just a few. So, yeah, but we have some, and the, the other is looking at papers that do well and what fraction of there. So there's some indication uh, that we also highlight papers with suggestions, you know, those uh, PRL suggestions, and those papers do very well. So that's not a small number. So if you think about it this way, so you guys have seen physics.aps.org, right? You're familiar with that. So that covers about, between that and PRL suggestions, there are about seven or eight papers. I think maybe a little more than that, which I think may be too many, but okay. A week, right? So that's not a small number. That's 400 to 500 papers a year. So those papers are papers that are a priori uh, selected, if you will, by the editors in anticipation that they're important papers. So we're doing it ahead of the, you know, before publication. And you look at the effective impact factor of those papers, that's, uh, I think the viewpoints are like 20, and the suggestions papers are of the order of 14, 13 to 14. So those, you know, those, but then, of course, the argument is why this, but they're sitting in a PRL of 2,500. Uh, yeah. from no, but we do have randomized trials of some other kinds. For example, we have, so your, your question is, are we a randomized trial on papers that we suggested but should not have been suggested? Uh, I, no, vice versa. I mean, uh, do you know if it is the fact that you highlight Could the paper? That I mean, there is some discussion that people have, people say that a paper that appears in a particular journal is more likely to be cited more just because it appeared in that journal. Right, That's but, but with suggestions, you have essentially uh, something that you can investigate completely freely because there's no obligation and no reason. But they're all suggested, right? I mean, they're, they've already been suggested, right? So when they're in the no. public arena, they already have that. So after the editor selects a certain paper right. as, uh, as reasonable to suggest, you could just a draft of it, but not publish it that the, 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 the fact that but that's the whole, I mean, so what, what you're, so we suggest papers because the things we suggest. So what you're suggesting it, I mean, okay, we have some numbers on that. Yeah. So the, what the, 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 uh, the test we don't want to do is we think these five papers should have been suggested and systematically not suggest one of them week in, week out. That's not something we want to do, but we do have papers. So when we suggest this, the system we have, which goes up and down in its, uh, in its restrictiveness, is that editors nominate papers for suggestions and then somebody else, some other people look at it and then they kind of think, oh yeah, that, you know, because the editor's calibrations may be different. And so we have a set of papers which were nominated by the editor who handled it and then didn't pass the final whatever. And so these papers have substantially lower numbers. We have papers, for example, which have get the PRL cover. And the papers would get the PRL cover uh, effectively have no more different uh, effective impact factor than the average PRL. Because we don't choose them based on any kind of importance or anything, we just choose them on aesthetics. But that experiment that you're suggesting is difficult to do because that would mean getting perfectly decent papers and then not suggesting it. Right. Uh, we don't want to do that. 
<laughs> okay, I don't know how much, uh, should I have this or should I skip this? This is just detailed stuff. I can, so, okay, I tell you, so the, mod, so the modular approaches, this, this part will give you a little insight as to what we do while we review the paper. There's another one where I have some, uh, not so much advice, I mean, again, this is a group that is already there, so you don't need to hear it, but as an editor, when a paper comes in, what I'm looking for in terms of uh, how the paper should or should not make it, that's another module, and I have something I can present on the impact factor. What sequence would you like me to go in? Any thoughts? PRL review process, what the editor wants and does not want from a paper, Impact factor. Let's do the second. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go to the second, and then if we have time, we can switch back. All right. So this is basically, so it's the intent here is not so much to tell you how to do it, even though it sounds like that, I guess but it's more like, what am I looking for? All right. So this is the problem of the physicist, and what is the problem? The problem is that when PRL turned, a uh, physical review, not PRL, turned 100, we got all this coverage from the New York Times, but this was the coverage. <laughs> you can read it, this is the New York Times, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> So if you think about it, and routinely we have discussions, I've had discussions here with people, is that in general, I mean the, the point is, and this is something uh, Johannes and I talked about and I'll repeat it here, is that if you could operate in a world where everything that you do, there are two constraints that you unfortunately face, right? The first one is that there's this whole publication thing going on, that you have to publish your results, you have to get them into journals, you have to do things so you get promoted and this and that. So that's one unfortunate uh, con uh, you know, development, whatever, but that this is a game that you have to play. So whether you like it or not, whether you think it's important or not, that's one thing. And the other thing is, much of what you do, if you could operate in a world of people who understand exactly what you're doing, who are exactly in your field of expertise and so on, and those were the decision makers, then you'd be okay. But unfortunately, you're not, right? I mean, you're running into people such as editors <laughs> and, 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 and tenure committees and um, uh, press offices at universities which decide to pick this or that uh, to publicize and all that kind of thing, which is a world of people who are not physicists, right? Or not, not physicists in your particular area. And so that's something, uh, those are the two constraints, I think. The question is how to tackle them. So some thoughts on how to, Submit a paper so it gets through the editor's, uh, editor's cynical attitude, if you will. So this is the most important book that I recommend to people who are constrained to have to write. And this is the most important uh, advice contained in that book. So, you know, the interesting thing is I was in uh, Spain last year at, uh, at uh, I think it was ICMM or maybe uh, and as I gave the talk, and I, I mentioned this book, and then I went to, uh, uh, some of you might know her, uh, my uh, friend Elsa Prada's office, and she had a couple of postdocs sitting around, and they, they all took out this book. <laughs> they already had that book, and somebody else had told them that. So. so this book is available for free even on the internet. All right, so the most important thing is keep it simple. I mean, you have to keep things simple. It's one thing uh, in, in, in written papers, certainly in talks and everywhere, so here are, here's an example of a sentence which is full of acronyms and I have been to, I have been to rooms where I've given this talk and I asked people what you know, SWCNT stood for and these are your colleagues in your departments and they had no idea what that meant. So that's the first, uh, <laughs> so, so that sentence, the first sentence is basically the second sentence. So that's the first advice. You have to keep it simple. All right, so this is something I already mentioned, that at least the introduction has to be accessible to somebody who is not in your field. Because these papers are floating around. Like to give you a simple thing, you know, like 
you know, we nominate these papers, right, for viewpoint. Papers that get viewpointed do very well, citation-wise. They float out every, you know, all these places. To put it another way, when you go on the BBC or New York Times website and you see any kind of physics coverage, that is almost never accidental. All of those papers have been pushed to those uh, newspaper publications or what, by either the journals or your press office or that kind of stuff. So a very, pretty much all the PRLs that get picked up have some presence as a viewpoint or something like that. Those viewpoint selections are being made by people who, who do have PhDs in physics and they're, but they're not, you know, they don't know any of this stuff. So they're gonna, but they look at the paper. The newspaper journalist probably does not look at the PRL and, you know, the PRL. But the viewpoint people are looking at it and if they don't get it, they come back to us and say, oh, I don't see why it's exciting and so on. Then I try to make some kind of a case but sometimes if I don't really feel strongly, my attitude is, eh, if the paper doesn't make the case, I'm not gonna try that hard. So, you know, there's that kind of thing. So the paper, at least the introduction, is being read by people uh, who are, you know, not at all uh, in the field. All right, so referencing is important. This is something you know, I think, in this, uh, in this group of people, this is not important. All right, so this I think is quite important. I mean, I think, um, especially with PRL and other journal, I mean, uh, maybe not for Fisher B so much, but for PRL, when you write a paper, have somebody else read it and give you some feedback. And that somebody else, I'm not, it's not the, you know, the proverbial grandmother test. There are scenarios where there's a grandmother test, but this is not it. Just have another colleague in your department who is not familiar with uh, you know, edge states and quantum Hall physics read your paper and give you some feedback. Because, you know, if, if that person doesn't get it and that person is a friend of yours, you can buy that person a beer, chances are the editor will not be uh, convinced. And this is important, and this is our uh, Hira and I were talking about it, this is impressions matter and first impressions matter even more. So you have to make the, the paper kind of, in 10 minutes has to be accessible in that sense. Uh, there's a cover letter that we have for PRL. So again, PRL is typically looking for why did you submit to PRL? And as, the edit, as an editor, I'm looking at the paper and I'm looking at the cover letter. I'm just kind of going through all of it and I'm trying to make sense of these things quickly. And if it takes me too much time, then you're forming kind of a negative impression slowly. Uh, in, you know, in PRL, for example, you can't specify which referees you think we should consult. That's very useful information. Uh, there is no guarantee that I will, uh, but it's useful information. Please do not uh, recommend recent co-authors. I mean, there are people who have published a lot, and I don't care if they're co-authors, you know, in, over the years, but I don't want some, you to make recommendations of people that you're currently co-authoring with on other papers. And also do make use of the place where you can provide names of people that we should not consult. Because think of it this way. I could send your paper to a pos, you know, maybe there are 100 people I could consult, Maybe logistically I could go to 20 of them. It really is not worth my time to get into some kind of political battle by sending it to the three people, or one of the three people that you think should not look at it. On the other hand, we have received papers where somebody says, do not send it to anybody in France or Germany. <laughs> you know, if it's something like that, you know, I'm just gonna ignore it, right? I mean, that's, uh, to me, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, and now this is, a, this is specific to this group. I mean, I think when you got large, uh, large uh, collaborations of uh, like the LHC type experiments, that's a whole different uh, thing, which I have trouble, you know, I have trouble selecting a referee on those collaborations. If I had to, I don't, because there's all kinds of weird politics there, which is not. Uh, and this, of course, is also important. If you think there is some, some kind of uh, information like this that you should convey to the editor, it's always good to tell them. No, that you think that uh, do not send it to this particular group because they're working on the same thing, or if you have a sense that somebody is working on uh, some similar system that you don't want them to see your stuff because it's not in the, you know. Uh, I'll skip this, not important. All right, so this is important. I mean, I mean it's unfortunate, but people at various levels, editors, other people, people who are scrolling through the archive, they're just, you know, they're not looking at the paper in detail unless they know that they should look at it in detail. 
So they're just looking at what is essentially, you know, perfunctory stuff, right? I mean, they're looking at the abstract introduction, the figures, conclusion, references, that kind of stuff. So it's important to have good figures and so on. And the important thing is, I don't know if I have a word about the title here. You know, right? Sometimes, I mean, so this is something about, and the same thing applies to editors. I mean, the thing is, there are particular things like titles and abstracts, which are very important. So the title, for example, think of it this way. You know, in an age of tweets and uh, email uh, subscription alerts and so on, the title often is like a headless entity, which is context-free, floating out into the world without a paper behind it. And this is appearing in all kinds of places. Journalists are scrolling through titles because they're provided by press offices and so on. So the title itself has to be some kind of a hook that gets, you know, so these kind of things are very important. I mean, more important than you'd think, unfortunately, but that's what it is. There is a thing called a teaser which people write. Uh, I don't, uh, you don't write it, but the people who highlight, they write it, which is a short abstract kind of thing. That floats out in all kinds of weird places and people are just looking at those teasers. So I think, uh, so these kind of entities are quite important, I think. All right, so this is uh, the resubmission letter, right? So PRL, of course, you know, the big battle, guys send you bad news and you have to resubmit, unfortunately, if you want to. So the resubmission letter, it has to be short. It's interesting that we often receive resubmission letters which are like twice the length of the article, right? So the first thing is the editor doesn't really want to read that. And I'm sure referees don't want to read something which is twice the length of an article. So you can keep it short. I mean, there's no way not to. And referees, but you have to do it, respond to it in detail. So the referee, if the referee made some pointed remarks, and even if you think they're uncalled for, or, you know, for the use of a better word, stupid, you have to respond to the referee in some detail. Uh, because more often than not, unless there's a strong reason not to do that, the editor is likely to send the paper back to the referee. Or maybe other referees, but certainly the same referee. Politeness is important. There's no harm in being polite. Like Churchill said, you know, when he declared war on, uh, uh, on, on Japan, apparently he, he, he said something about, it gives me great honor, your majesty. And somebody said, why? Churchill said, it doesn't cost anything for me to be polite. So it's kind of like that. Describe revisions, and this is partly for the benefit of the editor. If you made some changes, you don't want me to have to sift through the paper and see where things changed. Just make it easy. Uh, and then, of course, uh, if you think that there is a real reason why you think it should not go back to this or that referee, please tell me. No, I'm just sitting there. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, well, you have to think of it this way. Again, I, I would always say that just imagine that you're making that argument partly to the referee, but, but partly to the editor. Who am I trying to convince in that response? On that subjective issue, you're trying to convince the editor, I think. Yeah. Uh, but you don't want to blow off the referee either, right? So, uh, yeah. I mean, so what people, what in that sense, I would think what you could do is you could submit, you can, re, you can, you can respond to the referee in whatever detail you think is necessary. And you could write, I mean, there are sections in the thing, you could take comments for the editor or whatever. And you could make that comment available to me separately, or if you, if you think that it's perfectly reasonable for you to even send it to the referee, then you could just you know, say you know, the, pointed, the pointed response to the referee's remarks and a separate note saying, by the way, this is why you think that it, you know. Because the general interest at the end of the day, really, it's a combination. I'm trusting the referee much more on the specifics of the validity kind of issues. And the other thing, I'm just kind of making a general assessment based on my sense of the field, the ref my sense of the referee's calibration, there are multiple referees and all that kind of stuff. Now I'll come train question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, coming uh, back to this uh, issue of, you know, somebody saying that the paper is good, but maybe it's not appropriate. So I'm sure uh, many people do that. I think that's the thing. Uh, if you're given a list of papers of, you know, 
of similar significance apparently that, that were published uh, in PRL and then that author says, look, you published 10 papers like mine. Yeah. Uh, not a good, think about this? That's argument? not a good argument because there are two ways to think about it, right? One with a good way for the, for, you, for the author is that, you know, this is an indicative that the field is important. It, it doesn't tell me that your paper is particularly important. Also, PRL's attitude could be, oh, yeah, we published 10 papers. We don't need an 11th one. Right. That's, that's right. 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 And, and the other thing is Last also, is and in case. some areas, it is often the case that I will look back on that kind of thing and I'll say, oh, yeah, maybe we should not have published some of those papers. <laughs> right? And that's often the case. You know, and so the, um, to show evidence of similar published papers is a strong argument for the, well, if, and if, whenever it's coming from the author, I'm slightly cynical, but if that is presented to me by a neutral party or an author I think is being, you know, neutral, it's a good argument for the currentness of the field. But to me, it's not a particularly good argument for that particular paper. I, I felt it's a crappy argument, actually. So what? I felt that it was a bad argument somehow. Yeah, it's not a good argument. It's not, uh, Right. And also, you know, some fields, you know, they're extremely, so there are some fields which are, you know, I had a long discussion about this. So when, uh, graphene is a very good example, carbon nanotubes kind of a bit before that. There are some areas where suddenly something happens, myron or fermions, a lot of people get in on the act. And a lot of stuff is produced. And it's simply not possible for referees, people in the field, editors to figure out what, of which of them are important or not, you know, for PRL. So what you will see pretty much all the time is that papers are published, and when you look back on it with the benefit of hindsight, it was over-publication, too much stuff. So that, but the problem with that is the corrective action will come soon, right? In other words, at some point, people, referees, the editor will start feeling, oh, uh, there are too many papers on these proposals, and then they will I mean, the clearest example is BICEP2, right? When BICEP2 was published, a whole bunch of theory papers came in. It was so many that they had to coordinate publishing several of them in the same week because boom, they all started coming in. And at the beginning, there was a lot of, you know, they did their best, the, the editors, and they, you know, they got help from external people to figure out which subset of them they should publish and not. They did it, but then these papers kept coming and they got more, increasingly more and more, you know, uh, skeptical. All right, so this is responding to the reports. Uh, this is all stuff you know, so I'll skip this. All right, so this is, I've forgotten what this is, but let's look at it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this is, that's right. So, all right, and I did add something here, almost always. So there are, like I said, there are a few papers where the journal has a clear sense that it is in the journal's interest to go after this paper and move it through the system quickly and publish it. There is not much doubt that it'll get published and so on and so forth. You know, big labs produce something, editors will go on there. But for most papers, the ground state, like I said, it is not a PRL. So, right. So what's the percentage of the papers that get in rejection? 35, I have some slides, I'll show it to you in a minute. Oh, actually I skipped that part, okay, sorry, yeah. So, paper, PRL now rejects about 30 to 35 percent of papers without any review. Right, but then after the first review, uh, there is a Right. Uh, and some the, of those will eventually get published. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so the question, so, okay, so 35 percent of papers that come in are rejected without referee reports. Some fraction of them eventually, when the authors go through the appeal and this and that will get published. That fraction is of the order of two and a half to three percent. So in other words, if your paper is rejected without review and it's within those 35 percent, I mean there is a finite likelihood that it'll appear if you kept persisting, but if I told you that the likelihood is of single digit percentage, would you do it? Uh, sorry, single digit percent, percent for those who actually did appeal or for all of them? For, for papers of from fraction, I have a, let me show you. Is it 10% or is it 10% or 2.5%? <laughs> yeah. 
It's um, so that's what it is, roughly. Rejected without review. Yeah. And we submit it means we submit it as an appeal to the rejection. It doesn't have to be an appeal. Yeah, this is resubmit. Some of them will send out to referees or not. Yeah. So they come back. So that's the fraction. Now, one could, you could argue that if all the people who are in the green knew to resubmit and that was much higher, maybe a higher fraction of them would get published. I don't know. So, I mean, it's possible that, uh, but in other words, the, when you've the likelihood of getting a publish that's reviewed is low, but still significantly higher than one that was rejected without review. All right, where am I? But what does numbers should tell us, really? I mean, do you get submissions of, you know, from you know, crazy people? No, these are not, these are not crazy, crazy. <laughs> and a crazy, there are crazy people's submissions, but they're not so much in condensed matter. If you're a crazy person, you wouldn't write a condensed matter. Paper. You'd write one on general relativity or okay. something like that. <laughs> No, these are, these are, <laughs> condensed, you know, the, the crazy person doesn't know condensed matter, right? They, they know general relativity and, uh, and, you know, speed of light or something like that. So, and they get a lot of, no, these are not that kind of papers. These are papers which are our senses, and it's almost the way, I mean, and this is not, you know, not making a self, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, self patting statement. My attitude with these papers is, you know, I could send this paper through review, but my sense is, from all the experience that I have, and in many cases I have consulted on that particular paper, I may have quick informal advice from a divisional associate editor, the sense is that this paper could go through the system or the review process, but it, it's very likely not going to make it. Mm -hmm. So it is in our best interest the referee's best interest, and in the author's best interest, if they submitted it now to some other journal, often FISRA B. So, and it's possible that you submit it to FISRA B and they have the same sense, okay. So, should I wind up or should I go to impact factor or something? I, or do I have more questions? Let me see. So, what is the weight of condensed matter? What do you mean by weight? weight uh, I would, I, I said, I mean, I think if the uh, acceptance rate of condensed matter papers is uh, similar to overall PRL, I think so. I would be, by condensed matter, do you mean your kind of condensed matter? Do you mean polymer physics and soft matter included? Just included. Okay, then about 70%. Perfect. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I think it's a March meeting versus other meetings. I mean, that's. I mean, it's the most people, most physicists are doing condensed matter, right? And also condensed matter, uh, condensed matter has more papers. For, experimental condensed matter has many more papers per unit of authors as opposed to LHC, for example. So you have all that uh, is, uh, all right, so I'm going to. I mean, what is the average time from submission to publication? Right. For my personal. So this is an interesting uh, question I had. So we looked at it. See, average time, I'll show you. Let me see if I can. So my urge to skip, I should skip some of these things which I was going to show you. Anyway, I don't have that number here, but it's about um, the average. Now, of course, what I don't have the numbers is um, it's about uh, 100 and I think it's about four months. Now, this includes papers which are, there are two kind of things you should discount, right? So one is it includes papers which are rejected without review. They move out of the system real quick, right? So that, but also it includes papers which everyone and their friends could have told them is not likely to appear, but they, you know, there's a persistence, because we, you know, it's a society journal, you have the right to appeal, and people will appeal, right? So this make, so there are papers which go through the system for much longer than reasonable, just because you can appeal. So they have two rounds, and it goes to the DAE as an appeal, then it sits with the DAE for two months, and so that's added up. But the problem I have, and this is a discussion I had with you guys yesterday, I think there are some papers which we publish, so by definition, papers 
ex without some exceptions, and most papers we have published, we want to publish. Uh, some papers we publish because we give up, but okay. So most papers we publish because we want to publish, and then if you look at the, um, the review process, sometimes it seems that things could have been shorter by you know, a month. And that's because we, we sent it to two referees and we waited for the second referee much longer than we should have, or you know, this kind of, or we made decisions uh, slowly. Are, I mean, so that's the. Uh... Okay, so the question now is shall I wrap it up? Because I don't know what I'm supposed to finish. It says six o'clock, but that's like an hour and a half, right? Yeah, that's. Or should, do you have more questions? Do you want me to talk a little bit about impact factors? What do you want to do? I would rather go through the refereeing processes. If, um, Is there any kind of consensus of any, any type? Yes. So maybe let's just take one related. Okay. So, uh, I mean, uh, people, so, so I don't know if you see this as a problem. People are, uh, people like us, that they, especially in many careers, everybody is super busy. Yeah. That's, that's there's no good incentive to uh, really yeah. study a paper well. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what to do about it. Yeah, it's a, that's a difficult problem. And I can tell you, um, so there are, there are, okay, let me see. I, we can talk about many things. But there, are two, there are several things I could say. The first thing is, the, one of the motivations behind rejecting papers without review, and which are ultimately somewhat arbitrary subjective decisions, right? And one of the motivations behind doing this kind of thing, and we were actually advised to do this, we had a, a review panel that met and talked to you know, a bunch of people, and they felt that we should be, even if perhaps unfair in the broad sense of the term, we should do it just because the number of available referees doesn't quite match the number of papers that we received, right? So the decision has to be made at some level. So the problem is also, if you submit a paper to me, Right? Let's say it's a paper on some kind of transport measurement and gallium arsenide. Now, I could go to people who are you know, experts in that, somebody in this room, and I say, okay, just sit down and think of, you have all day, think of the people that you would trust if you knew who they were to get me, send me a good report. So you could come up with 50 names, right? But the problem is, of those 50 names, it's entirely possible that five never ever respond to any referral requests. Maybe the, some other five are really, you know, they reject, they advise rejection on everything because they're ill-tempered. There could be other five who have not to work, who, who say, oh no, I'm not interested in that anymore. And there are some others who are really good, but they always have referrals from either us or another journal, right? So what often happens is you could have a set of 50 people that you would like to send it to, but really of those 50, maybe only 10 are available and they have other stuff, so then you have to go to the second set of 50. I mean, you're as, a, as, a, as a set that you're looking at. So this often means that sometimes the referees that you'd like to send it to are often not available. So that's one problem. Now the other, another problem I've heard from people about writing referee reports that you said is difficult is people who write good papers are not necessarily good uh, I'm not talking about good researchers. Let's assume everybody is a good researcher. People who write good papers are not necessarily good referees. Now, there could be multiple reasons for it. And one reason was given to me when I was traveling. Uh, it was in China, actually. And they said, you know, so China is a clear example where the quality and number of papers is growing sharply, but the number of referees we have from China has lagged proportionately. And we have some difficult... So one of the thing, arguments was, if your language is not English, Right? But you're writing a paper, it's different because you can get help from people. You are not writing in isolation. You, you have co-authors, you have a graduate student whose English is likely much better than yours, you can work on it. But when you're writing a referee report, it's an exercise in isolation, right? You're writing it by yourself, but it's not anonymous to the editor. So there is some, un, you know, there's some un uneasiness about it, that you're writing a paper, uh, writing a, you know, some, material that will be available to somebody to look at and it'll be badly written. And so often, sometimes the referees are reluctant, you know, that's one of the things. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, uh, not enough good referees. That's certainly the case. Now, uh, 
One solution to that, which I don't think is a great solution, is that you, I mean, some journals do that, that a handful of people do some, you know, triaging or something, uh, which, who are, I mean, that's, so I, I don't know what the solution is. Uh, you said the incentive part, right? And so there have been behavioral economists who've worked on this kind of thing, which is, I don't know if people here follow. There's a guy, um, I'm forgetting his name, it'll come to me. So there were studies done which basically is that uh, there are, there are um, contributions that people will make which they will do for free because they feel it's a, something they should do for the community. So the big example is lawyers who, could, who per hour pay is $400. They would do pro bono work because they feel that is a contribution they make. But if you say, oh, how about you do this and we'll give you some money. If the money is nowhere near $300 because you can't afford it, then they will get offended and not do it. And so that's the kind. So for PRL, for example, the number of referees we have, and I think pretty much all, we cannot offer financial incentives or anything like that. And it would not be fair to say if you review five papers of ours, your next paper will move through the system quickly <laughs> or something. So really, so what, what they do have, which some people I think value, is they have the Institute of this uh, Outstanding Referee Reward, which unfortunately, is there anyone here who's got it? It's pretty good because one of the ways you get it is you've done a lot of stuff over the years. So I think that kind of a, so I don't know. Did you appreciate it? You can say no. Uh, yes, but I have. I still I still agree with the with the point about the importance of the incentive scheme. Uh, but so I think the most uh, somehow disappointing part about the review process is that. Uh, I mean, I do, I do fully agree that it is a community service. But it is a community service uh, which gets completely hidden from the community. Right, we talked about this. So yeah, right, exactly. So yeah. I mean, this is a tough one. So one of the discussions we had is whether referee reports should be made available for viewing on published papers. So I don't know. I mean, I feel, I mean, I've talked to people, and so the idea would be if you have a paper that has been published, which means the journal has kind of taken on the responsibility of vouching for it, right? That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Would you want it to be available with a scathingly negative report next to it for people to look at? I don't know. Sorry? And also, allow people to raise the proof that this used to be like in the solid state. Yeah, but you don't want that. Because then you don't have to take a bit more responsibility when they say it. But the whole anonymous process means that referees are more free to say bad things about famous well, people. Okay, well, then it's a biased system, right? Because that means you have a, you have a published entity where the only names you're revealing are names of people who said nice things about the paper. Yeah, but then if it's a bad paper, then But then why would you uh, would you not let's say? Uh, That's that I believe get less and less common because of the extra effort. And we can talk about this uh, more, you know, but I, I see a question in the back. But we'll, go I, think, I think actually because of the age we live in, I think it should be a possibility, at least in principle, yeah. to leave the comment on... Uh, I mean, to me it happened twice that I reviewed the PRL paper. Yeah. Uh, and I, one time I... I uh, actually, both times I recommended... I, I mean, I recommended both papers. It was a separate... Uh, time, but the thing is that after thinking, like a year later, after yeah. thinking about, I realized that both papers are actually wrong. <laughs> and I mean, I, even I talked to authors and I kind of provided yeah. an argument to them why I mean, it's actually wrong. But I, I think mean, it's just there. And what, actually, one group agreed, another one disagreed, and that's fine. I mean, one thing we, we have talked about is just that logistically, I don't think we want to do it because, you know, but it could happen is that you could have papers after publication be available for general comments. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are lots of people who will then point to all kinds of internet entities where such commenting quickly, I mean, all you have to go and look at is, uh, I mean, actually, New York Times is far better than CNN, but just go look at CNN. I mean, no, there are it, people. I think in our community, it will be much more civil, right? Well, it's that's what you, uh, I don't know. I mean, it could be, it could be. Uh, there. Yeah. I mean, 
we have examples of large commercial enterprises that know how to handle comments that are very useful. Right. We all use them to find No, I, I agree. I, I think there would be some, I, I think, I think if, if yeah. I mean, we, we haven't come up with it just because logistically it's, we don't feel that it's, you know, worth our, but on the other hand, if we could have a properly moderated common discussion well, on even I a subset of papers. Comment to that. In fact, I think for some of the archive, right. papers, archive had writing it, yeah. blogs there, let's say students or whoever discusses them. So it's mm -hmm. not really uncommon. Yeah. And, and, and there are all kinds of funny or non-funny comments yeah. on there. Yeah, it, it exists. It's, it's, it's already existed. It's existed. Yeah, it just yeah, yeah. sense. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, is there? No. Go ahead. Sorry. Back, back to incentives. I guess it's, it's clear that Ryan can get paid for it free. Okay. But but one thing that I think would be nice is any kind of feedback. I mentioned this the other day. So well, we, I do, I put a lot of work in when right. I do a rough report. It takes me a whole day, and I would like to know if in the end it's actually useful for the editors or if I can. Half the time or actually, so can I add that you make a you make an assessment of your viewers, but I have no idea what you think of the other viewers. But I, I that's useful. Am I doing it right yeah, now? but then uh, okay, that's right. So, but the quite the I mean, that's I mean, I, I, I agree. Okay, so the one point is whether the feedback on the individual paper, right? So, you refereed a paper, or in general, okay, so you refereed a paper and the paper was eventually published or rejected. So if the paper is published, what we do send you is you get all the other reports, the resubmission letters, and something from sometimes, if the editor will write something. Uh, you will, uh, sometimes more and more, if you send a report that we find makes a point without substantive reasoning behind it, we might query you. That's not really feedback, but OK. Uh, so we do that. Uh, some individual editors will send you more feedback as to how useful they found your report or not. Uh, I, I, I agree, that would be a good thing to do. I mean, if we did it more and more, that kind of thing. Now, at the end of the year, people get uh, kind of an email of, of all the papers that they reviewed and how they fared. So that is as a record of what you did. Uh, you should, I mean, you get it, right? So you, everybody, I think you should get it. If you don't get it, it's being spammed. Now, your question was, I think, so that's a tough one because, so, right. so if you are, I mean, I, I don't know a good mechanism because the problem we have is we have some people who are very good researchers who think they're good referees. We routinely hear because they'll write to us and say, my paper you know, took uh, six months to, to get reviewed and this and that. And then we look at what they did and the last 10 referrals to them ended up in a, essentially a black hole, right? So, but these are big guns who do, you know, after all, you know, they're being referees for, you know, and they really are horribly bad referees, right? So I don't want to give them that feedback. I mean, they know it. So that's a tough, uh, I mean, the only kind of feedback that will be well received in this kind of a setup would be positive feedback, I, I think. So I think maybe the biggest user example is we've all gotten papers reviewed where um, the reviewers commented just two sentences, published just right. a couple sentences. But you offer no feedback to a reviewer saying, no, we do that more and more. I think we didn't do it much before, and we'll do it. But in fairness to you, we are more likely to feed, to push back on the referee on that kind of report if it is uh, positive without cause, as opposed to uh, negative without cause, just because of the ground state scenario that I presented. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, that's, right, I mean, that's a, I mean, how to write a good report, we've talked about it, uh, uh, that, uh, in fact, I think we might do something like, here are some good reports, you know, that kind of thing, we might do that. It's a, it's a, you know, because what happens is, I think, what does happen over time, there are two issues, right, I mean, I mean, the big, the one thing is, of course, referees who don't send reports at all, that's, you know, and then they, unfortunately fall off our radar, right? Because what we do is we have a very detailed referee database, which I didn't go into, but we have uh, every referee report that comes in to, to any of the FizRef journals has three numbers attached to it. One is assigned by the computer, which tells us how long they took, or if they reported at all, right? So that's that. The other is uh, 
a rating of the referee's recommendation. So on a scale, it would be five for reject completely, I don't, you know, or one is published right away. And then the third number is something where it is the editor's assessment of the quality of the report, helpfulness, how helpful it is to the editor. And so those three numbers are collecting over time, and in many cases over you know, a long time, and then you can do all kinds of statistics on them. We have those numbers, but of course, the, sorry? Is that is not accessible to you. I don't know, but you have to, you have to put it in context, right? Uh, I mean, so the typical scenario is, um, I mean, would it be useful? Let's say, let's say Katya, for example, is not responding to referral queries, you know, 60% of the time, or if we send her a report, she takes eight weeks to write a report. I mean, just as an example. Is that information that in isolation would be useful to her? Eight weeks is acceptable? Eight weeks is not. <laughs> right. So that's the thing. So I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I would like to give that feedback to people, but I, unless you're putting all kinds of caveats and context, contexts and other stuff along with it, uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe one thing we could do is we could... Uh, give some average statistic available to people, but then, you know, uh, maybe we should, uh, I, I mean, you know, it was useful, like, it was, it's important, it's helpful, was helpful. Or right, I mean, that's on a paper by paper basis, I think that is maybe what, is something we should do more. Uh, isn't it already done? So what is? Every now and then, I receive a thank you for a helpful review you know. No, that's right, so, but that's, but that, but that, that is, uh, you get that, but that doesn't tell you, yeah, I mean, you get some, that's a sporadic thing, and you get the yearly, but it's not like you, it's not like a Metacritic rating on a movie, oh, okay. right? I mean, you don't know that your movie got uh, a th score of 37, which is not good because it's red and everybody else is green and yellow. You don't know that. And that would be useful, I guess, yeah. but uh, would it change the, I don't know. So in terms of the word, you that might, you might have this, uh, this style of uh, you, you probably normalize No, no, we have a very detailed database, uh, so extremely. When you teach a referee, you know what's his statistic yeah. for Every. a paper and you take it into account? Uh, well, let me put it this way. If, I, if you sent me a paper, and independent of how good or how bad it is, I wanted it rejected, I could go ahead and look for a long time and find two referees who would reject it no matter what. <laughs> I mean, that, we have that kind of information. So yeah, we have very detailed... Uh, and in fact, we even have statistics that some editors have generated which correlates the referee's recommendation to publish or reject to how the papers that they recommended publication and we did publish fare later on in terms of citations and stuff like that. So you could go batty with that kind of, you know, you could go to any number of, uh, but in general, we, like, we, for each referee, we have a very detailed database uh, entry which has these three numbers collecting over time and then all kinds of, uh, in fact, roughly this is when we, uh, when the outstanding referee uh, names are listed in each year, what is roughly, we used to sit and people used to obsess over who should get it, who should not get it. At the beginning, of course, there was a lot of attention paid to people who had done it over the years and so on. But now we just, you know, punch a number, a bunch of names come out, and then people have some veto power. You know, it could be that uh, sometimes, you know, people might say, yeah, this numbers indicate this. But in general, you know, we just go by the numbers. And the numbers are very precise. But, you know, numbers could be, uh, like, you could be, it could be that a whole sequence of not so good papers was sent to that referee. That's mm -hmm. why they're negative. I don't know. Just a Brian, uh, what is, is your criteria when someone becomes a referee, when you're comfortable sending a paper for Wow. Well, okay. So we have, um, well, this used to be interesting, right? Because uh, there was a time when, like I said, the, most of the referees were from the US and so on. Because even 15 years ago, it was not easy to know about what somebody is doing and how well they're doing unless you actually knew them or were quite familiar with their work. But now, of course, you can, in our own database, we can say, we can see if person A has published, you know, so many phys revs and PRLs and what their acceptance rate was, we, that is, you know, click of a button, we can go to web of science and all kinds of stuff. So it's very easy to get statistics on people. So the criteria basically is, 
If they publish quite a bit in our journals, which is true of people here, then we will look to see you know, what stage they're at and how they're doing. So there's some you know, reasonable success rate, reasonable number of publications as first or second authors or corresponding authors. That's one way to get in. The other is often ha uh, we will send a paper to somebody and we will encourage them to write a report with somebody else. And that person then gets in, the, the co-author of the report. If they happen to be a graduate student, we will put a note in the database which says something like, you know, if still at University of Maryland, then a graduate student. So when they move out and have some other address, that drops out. And then we always check the publication record over time. And if just because you got in to begin with doesn't mean that you stay as an active referee if you stop you know, publishing. There are certain areas which don't publish much in our journals. So for example, network physics. Uh, there could be people with very impressive publication records with essentially not much presence in our journals. And those editors you know, are, uh, and the web of science, for example, was a big help to them because there was a time when if you just looked in our database, you know, it looks like they're not publishing much. But so those kind of things. So that's how it, uh, it's basically we look at either we trust the advice of somebody that has, is working with them, whose advice we trust, or um, uh, their publication records. Uh, and we, you know, every, we routinely receive requests for people to be referees, and they're vetted by somebody, and they're either put in the database or not. So we do have some referees who got in because, for whatever reason, but then it quickly became clear that either they're not publishing much or are not good referees, and they just kind of sit there as unused referees. So anyway, Phil, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, there are all kinds of things I didn't talk about. I did not cover the review process <laughs> of PRL, uh, which is tough. And I did not talk about the whole impact factor dilemma and how we are thinking about it or anything. But those are things I think we've run out of time. But uh, feel free to talk to me about it if you want. And uh, so my intent, partly, you know, as Alex will say, to come and give this talk is twofold. One is to get you to all submit your good stuff to us because one of the things I didn't mention is while we are slow for a subset of papers which we think or which we are convinced are really important, we can move very fast. We've published papers in under a week, which is unrealistic in, in this matter, but we've published papers, you know, we can publish it in a, in a month. Like if you think we're getting solid signals about it. And the other is, of course, uh, I uh, often travel uh, to universities, give seminars and colloquiums. So if any of you would like me to go visit you guys, I know some of you already do, feel free to you know, please talk to me and uh, get me to come and visit you. And I can give you a different modular version of this talk. I'm very happy and keen to meet with uh, graduate students and other people. And uh, of course, I often go to places where I'm talking to people who are not at all in my area of interest, but that's okay. PRL is a very broad journal and I have to, so anyway. <laughs>